Good evening, everybody. I'm Martha Johnson, Director of the Mayor Museum of Art at Randolph College. And I'd like to welcome you to the kickoff event for the 2021 Science Festival at Randolph College. I'd like to thank Peter Sheldon, the Charles A. Dana Professor and Chair of Physics and Engineering and the inventor of the Science Festival for welcoming us as collaborators this year. Please join us for events Thursday through Sunday for all ages. On Thursday, we have the highlight of the weekend, our keynote speaker, author James Kakalios, who will be speaking on the science of superheroes. Friday, we have our women in science panel, poetry reading, and a scientist goes to the movies, my personal favorite. We will be streaming Marvel's Black Panther and we'll have a scientist doing commentary. The weekend finishes off with an amazing virtual maker fair where you will meet more than 20 local makers and be able to see what they do. For more information and links to these events, please visit www.randolphscience.org and click on events. I wanna thank our curator of education, Laura McManus, for coordinating this evening's lecture. We can help her out by making sure our mics are muted to minimize competing sounds. Also, as you think of questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to type them into the chat feature, but we will save all questions until the very end. And Laura will facilitate a Q&A. I wish to thank Ann Wilkes Tucker, class of 1967, former trustee and curator emeritus for the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. Anne curated the wonderful 109th exhibition of contemporary art, currently on view, entitled Time and Place, Water, Sky, Land. It presents four American artists interested in human connection to the natural world, James Baylog, Terry Evans, Mark Klett, and Erica Blumenfeld, who we host tonight. Before we get started, I'd like to thank Mary Grace Shockey, class of 1969 and former trustee who has graciously supported every annual since the 100th, including the one we are enjoying now. So we are deeply grateful to her. Erica Blumenfeld is a transdisciplinary artist working at the intersection of art, science, nature, and culture. Blumenfeld's research-based practice is motivated by the wonder of natural phenomena, often leading her to collaborate with scientists and research institutions, including NASA, Scripps Institution of, Ocean of Oceanography, McDonald Observatory, and the South African National Antarctica Program. Blumenfeld is a Guggenheim Fellow, Smithsonian Fellow, and recipient of a Rauschenberg Foundation Artist in Residence and Creative Capital Grant. She has exhibited widely in the US and abroad, including the Albright Knox Art Gallery, Foundation EDF, Nevada Museum of Art, Ballroom, Marfa, and Tate Modern, among others. Her work is featured in Art and Ecology Now, published by Thames and Hudson, and the Polaroid book, published by Taschen. And her work resides in many permanent collections, including Albright Knox Art Gallery, Lannan Foundation, Houston Museum of Fine Art, and New Mexico uh, Museum of Fine Art. So please join me in welcoming Erica Blumenfeld. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, everyone. Um, let me just get settled here. Fantastic. Can you see my first slide? Great. Um, well, thank you so much, Martha, for that really warm welcome. And thanks to everyone who is joining us this evening. Um, I'm incredibly grateful to Ann Wilkes Tucker and Martha Johnson for inviting me to be a part of the uh, Time and Place exhibition at the Meyer. Um, and it's really been a wonderful experience to work with you on this exhibition. Um, and I also want to thank Laura McManus for inviting me to speak as, um, as part of the SciFest event um, at Randolph College. So 
My presentation is 45 minutes, and there are two layers to what I'm going to be sharing with you. And the first layer is the realm of ideas and knowledge seeking and begins with questions, um, leads to research and writing, and often ends with more questions. And the second layer consists of the artworks that arise in the wake of these, uh, this research and these ideas. And as I share both of these in vignettes of the writing and the artwork, my hope is that um, they together weave a deeper story about my practice. And the images and writing reflect each other, but they neither punctuate nor answer each other, and they may not always sync up perfectly, but rather they will each have their own rhythm. We cannot foresee how the journey of a creative idea will begin, but once the idea has sparked and taken hold, we can barely imagine its former absence. Whether my enduring childhood passion for the stars and obsession with rocks and fossils were all foreshadow, like a latent image imprinted on the core of my mind and heart awaiting unified focus and development, or whether random events that like the formation of the rocks and stars themselves coalesced and precipitated into form out of pure happenstance, I may never know. What is clear is that in the early days of August of 2011, while traveling to Inverness, Scotland from Glasgow, I drove through a road cut on a highway near the edge of the Great Loch Ness that changed everything. In that fleeting instant in which eons of geology flew by my window, a seed was unknowingly planted, a seed that has evolved into now 10 years of creative focus that continues to bloom but I'm getting ahead of myself. It began long before that. It really began with light. Light is truly one of the great wonders of our universe. Seemingly everywhere, it is but always fleeting. The desire to catch light and to know something of its essence underlies much curiosity and poetics of the arts and sciences across the ages. So much of our biology and sensory experiences are perfectly attuned to specific frequencies within the electromagnetic spectrum, visual, audio, thermal. One can imagine light as the great meeting between the ineffable and the tangible. Through light, we meet and embody the vastness of the cosmos. The ability of wavelengths in the visible light spectrum to be emitted or absorbed by the various conditions and substances in the world around us form the basis of illumination and color. Our beautiful blue sky, the brightness of, of the sun at midday, the red, orange red hues at sunset sparking across the ocean, the vibrant rainbows and mysterious aurora borealis are all expressions of the phenomena of light, bending, reflecting, and refracting, revealing the enigmatic subtlety of light's unyielding shifts in intensity and tone. My inquiry in, as a young photographer began with the question, what is the nature of light? My curios curiosity has not found rest in the answers to this question, however, but has grounded in the stream of questions that have continued to arise in its wake. Intellectually, we have formulated an understanding of the workings of light, but it is in the wondering about our direct experience with light that, is my, that my light recordings works begin. When I first began working in the photographic medium in 1987, I was interested in imaging things as they appeared to me in nature landscapes, the figure, still lives, the subtle abstractions of the like. Yet at a certain point in my early photographic practice, something in me shifted for a time. I was no longer compelled to take photographic representations of the things I saw with my eye. In 1998, a persistent conceptual question arose in my studio that I had to reckon with. Wasn't the experience of the thing itself a more intimate encounter with its true nature than the photographic representation of it? Why make an optical reproduction of a sunset or a person or an object when the real thing is happening right in front of you? Why represent anything at all when you can have an experience of it directly? These questions led me to discontinue photographing altogether for several months, during which time I pers pursued my interest in light through luminous pigments in painting and printmaking, but I eventually came back to photography through an unexpected discovery. Some of the most potent moments in the studio occur when it feels as though a medium is failing you and the creative existential crisis these moments propel can be valuable times of unforeseen innovation. 
It was in this way that I discovered a method to record the nature of light I had so longed for. I was making an adapter to fit my four by five inch Polaroid back into a 19th century double bellows studio camera, thinking I would try one last thing before I might give up on photography altogether. When I completed the fabrication, I installed the adapter into the camera to test it for light leaks, the, the photographer's nemesis. By exposing a piece of Polaroid film without opening the lens, I expected to see a fully black Polaroid. But when I peeled back the development enclosure to reveal the image, I found that I did have light leaking across through the adapter and it was stunning. A perfectly arc radiation of light across the film plane. The image was everything I was seeking at the time from a photograph, a documentation of light itself. I immediately began exploring the light leak's potential, building my own cameras in different sizes and configurations that replicated the original light leak. The light recordings process pared down photography to its most essential ingredients, light and light sensitive material. This became the conceptual starting point for my work and compelled me to image my experiences of daily natural light phenomena. With light as my medium and subject, the phenomena I could capture was literally endless, for in every moment, light is new. The question for me that arose during this process was what is the function of a photograph? In 2004, I was granted the opportunity to work in collaboration with the McDonald Observatory in far west Texas and had access to a site up on the main peak of the observatory in one of their astronomers' houses. During my two-month residency, I documented a full lunar cycle through an altered telescope and produced my first video-based work, a moving light that, was depict that depicted the lunation cycle 1011. Lunation is the mean time between two successive new moons, and the lunation number is calculated from the first new moon that occurred in 1923. Imaged through an altered telescope and self-built lensless camera devices, the varying intensities of light radiating from the moon were recorded onto handheld photographic film. The resulting images portray not only the changing quantity of the moonlight in its nightly phase, but also my own hand, which in holding each piece of film over the two minute long exposures, moved slightly from my own heartbeat and body's subtle sway. This piece demonstrated to me that the relationship between technology and the human implementing it. This relationship is expressed in the complete, completed video installation, where each of the exposures taken over the 30 days were animated in sequence to the speed of my own heartbeat to produce a moving account of the lunar cycle that is both human and planetary. By adopting a somewhat scientific methodology in my artistic process, I began to follow a rather non-traditional studio practice. And it is at this point that my inquiries led me to work alongside scientific and research institutions in order to further my knowledge of a particular field of scientific study. It was during that two month artist in residence at McDonald Observatory that my artistic direction took a new turn. Night after night, looking up at the universe through the intensely dark and unpolluted skies, I considered how few people around the world have enough dark skies to look up and see the universe clearly. In August 2007, I read that in the time of Galileo, Venus and the Milky Way were so bright that in our, unpolluted, our then unpolluted skies, that they would literally cast a person's shadow on the ground. Those thoughts led me to reflect on the historical versus the contemporary relationship between our natural environment and our civilization. While our technologies have stunningly allowed us to see into the microcosm of our bodies and the macrocosm of our universe, we are facing a moment where our technologies are also aiding in certain destabilizing effects to our earth, our water, and our air. From these late night under, nights under the stars in 2004, the Polar Project sprung into being. The Polar Project is an, an evolving series of environment-focused artworks that document the Arctic and Antarctica. Though seemingly far away, these rare and fragile ecosystems are crucial to Earth's stability and humanity's future. Continued anthropogenic climate disruption and glacial melting is bringing unprecedented ch challenges to all of humanity and the other species that we share this planet with. After decades of leading scientists warning of the effects of climate disruption, we are now seeing these effects with our own eyes. And the amount of ice melting in these regions is increasing. My work's new direction explored getting under the skin of these issues. Underneath the complexity of our changing climate, resource demands, 
social imbalances, economic injustices, and troubled political system, underneath even the search for solutions to the DNA of connectedness, not just our connectedness with the, our connection with each other, but our connection with other species and the entire Earth system, but even our connection with the systems that govern our planet's formation, as well as our solar systems, extending all the way back to how we might be connected to the moment our universe burst into being. In other words, a connectedness that is at the same instant profoundly personal and intimate and yet encompasses the whole cosmos. The Polar Project was meant to capture and preserve the changing landscape of these regions at a time when the conversation about the climate crisis was not as widely discussed as it is today. My goal was to create a series of visceral experiences of these remote yet critical landscapes so people could build a relationship with them in the hopes of cultivating a sense of ecological empathy to protect these places and ultimately our global ecosystems. It has been established across many fields that humans have a biological need for a connection with nature, with our natural world, not simply for recreation or aesthetic reasons and not solely for sustenance reasons, but for literal healthy biological function, including the health of our brains and nervous system. There is a term that was established in the mid 1990s within the fields of ecological conservation that has interested me a great deal called shifting baseline syndrome. Originally used to determine baselines in fishery science, the term has become more broadly used to discuss the decline of our general knowledge of our natural surroundings and how they are changing. There are two types of shifting baselines. The first is generational amnesia, where there is a loss or extinction of knowledge because younger generations are not aware of what past ecological or biological conditions were once like. The second type is personal amnesia, where knowledge loss or extinction occurs because we individually forget our own experiences of nature conditions. The questions that have arisen from this research go deep. If we have a biological need for our natural world and yet we generation by generation are forgetting what this natural world was like and no longer realize we have a need for it at a fundamental level, then how can we hope to maintain a connection to our natural world that is resolute enough to protect it against further decline and devastation? How can we begin to remember we are inextricably linked to the natural world that evolved us? The questions that have guided my artistic research since the earliest days of my practice are those that seem to continuously seek to locate this sense of connectedness. And my work recurrently leads me to a specific emotion that I see as a convergence of both personal and cosmic reflection, the feeling of wonder. To me, wonder is a force. It has gravity. I bend toward it. Wonder is the ether of our inner universe, elixir for mind and heart. It is the mysterious encounter with the outer world that forges an ethos of benevolence and humility in the face of vastness. In the moment when we are fully taken by wonder, it is as if somehow we feel a sense of unity with the object of wonder itself, as if empathy can move beyond the animate and we stand in awe of a starry night or an Antarctic landscape or a glowing ocean or a rock from the moon seeking with all our faculties to feel and comprehend something of the inanimate. Research in the field of social psychology has shown empirically that during an experience of awe and wonder, we reframe our sense of self and world, and that this ability to accept a larger reality inspires us to feel small in the face of such vastness. In coming into contact with this small self frame of reference, we diminish emphasis on the individual self and self-serving interests in favor of a more altruistic perspective. We literally become more compassionate, helpful, and ethically oriented. Wonder connects us to our world and to each other in measurable ways. It seems significant in our moment of social and environmental turbulence to consider how human encounters with the wonders of our natural world might contribute to comp compassionate, helpful, and ethically oriented decision-making. Wonder is a proponent to curiosity, and we can peer across the origins of our many cultures to see that encounters with the world, the wonders of our world, has sparked some of humanity's greatest leaps of creativity and accomplishment. From our first representative paintings on a cave wall to our first steps on the moon, I've become curious about whether seeking wonder engagement could have a significant impact on our ability to face the deepening complexities of the Anthropocene. 
Bioluminescence is the wondrous living light that is widespread across our oceans, our world's oceans. Although mostly microscopic and seemingly disconnected from our daily experience, phytoplankton produce at least 50% of the world's oxygen. They are connected to every breath we take. They are also the base of the food chain, yet increased industrial waste and effect has affected phytoplankton populations around our coastlines. Bays once teeming with bioluminescence have diminished or vanished altogether. And climate disruption is increasing the temperature difference between warm waters, warm surface and deep cold waters, inhibiting the amount of nutrient mixing needed for phytoplankton to thrive. Losing populations of phytoplankton risks the health of our ecosystems, our coastal cultural traditions and life itself. Changes in marine ecosystems have been documented in most ocean regions around the globe, and studies have shown that populations may be down by as much as 40%. I began collaborating with marine biologist Dr. Michael Latz at his laboratory at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in 2001 and worked with him again in 2011. My intent was to learn how to care for these single-celled organisms called Pyrocystis fusiformis, one of the larger blue bioluminescent phytoplankton that glows in our oceans. In researching and documenting these organisms, I became aware of how incredibly sensitive to environmental changes they are and hoped the work would act, could activate a dialogue about the significance of even the smallest members of our ecosystem. In April of 2011, after seven months without rainfall, the Rock House fire ignited in Marfa and raged across the landscape of far west Texas, devastating the region's environment. I was living in Marfa at that time, and in those weeks while the wildfire reigned, I began collecting material from the burned landscape, carbonized trees, cacti, dirt, animal bones, grasses, and then photographed the charred remains and the blackened earth. By July 2011, the 317th consecutive month with above average global temperatures, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Climate Monitoring Division had already ranked 2011 as having seen the largest amount of acreage burned in the US from wildfires than in the 12 years previous. Extreme drought across the American Southwest from climatic dis disruption exacerbated wildfire con conditions that year causing the largest wildfire in Arizona's history, the second largest wildfire in New Mexico's history, and the third largest wildfire in Texas's history to occur within just a few months. All of the burned debris in these works were collected from areas that were private, state, or federally owned. At each location I had gathered debris, I was at some point evicted from the land, and in one case was asked to put back the burned material I had collected. This work considers the innate sacredness of nature alongside the human desire to own or manage the land, exploring the question, has our land management and ownership in one sense stolen the land from nature itself? In taking it back, the piece intends to resacralize nature beyond our possession of it. These works become forensic evidence of the crime of anthropogenic climate disruption. They are eulogy to the wildfires and homage to the nature they consumed. Yet as carbon is both the building block of all life and is itself an artifact of light, these works also intend to look to the regeneration that is possible as we look for solutions. It was through working on two exhibitions of my wildfire and bioluminescence work with Cape Farewell, a UK arts organization that focuses on the cultural impacts of the climate crisis that I was invited to join a small group of artists and scientists on their Scottish Isles sailing expedition in 2011, prompting another new direction in my work. Our, ex our expedition centered around interdisciplinary discussions, research, and art making that considered the cultural impact of climate change. Our journey would take us to meet the residents to discuss the effects that rising seas and environmental changes were having on their ecosystems, communities, and cultures. Witnessing the sheer magnificence of these islands' geologic wonders, I felt again my own motivation quicken to nurture cultural awareness of our innate connection to our natural world. What might be possible if wonder, scientific knowledge, and artistic knowledge all met on a level playing field? It would be two months 
after my expedition before the new trajectory took hold. On a quiet evening, tuned into a nerdy documentary about geology, a remarkable thing transpired. The camera panned to a geologist by a road cut on the highway to Inverness, Scotland from Glasgow, near the, great, near the edge of the Great Loch Ness, the same one I had driven past two months previous. Amazed at this coincidence, my sense of wonder started to rise as the geologist explained that when this road was made, revealing the strata of rock layer, it provided researchers an excellent view into the past that answered important questions. He explained that they came to understand that this road cut rock isn't just like the rocks in the Catskills in upstate New York, they are the same rock. That some 450,000 years ago in North America, that North America and Scotland collided, and this meeting is still visible. What he said next has been ringing in my ears since. But the story is in the rock. Rocks then become tomes of deep memory, stories in the form of chemistry and characteristics that can reveal messages from other worlds across time. From the moment the first rock held in warm hands met the human gaze of curiosity, the lithic realm found invitation into the evolving and restless human imagination. The earliest artworks are carved in stone by stone. Stone has been medium, tool, and canvas for our earliest vision, innovation, and inquiry. Our relationship with the lithic spans at least 2.6 million years and touches cultures from prehistory to this moment. We still collect, carve, utilize, and cherish stones. From the purest mineral forms to weathered beach cobbles, our passion for lithic engagement seems almost instinctual. But what drives this nearly conate relationship between human and rock, this intimacy between animate and inanimate worlds? Stones are, in essence, time travelers. Some are space explorers, having arrived to Earth from other planets after a journey through our solar system or even beyond. I like to think of rocks as scrolls of knowledge, passed down through the cosmic, planetary, and geologic ages that tell the story of primordial formation. In picking up a rock along a shoreline or mountain path, we evoke a moment when these forces meet the human mind and heart. We gaze into its complex structure to know something of its secrets, awaiting its tome of cosmic riddles to unravel. If one knows the language written in the stone, the answers begin to emerge. In my inquiry into the connection between living flesh and solid rock, I like to imagine that something of the shared chemical inheritance lingers, like natural memory, beckoning our wonder to excavate our shared sidereal origins. Somewhere in the fiery core of ancient stars is written the verse to the molecules in your body. Somewhere in the microscopic glint of a space traveling rock is written the verse to the molecules in your body. Somewhere in the heart of your human chemistry is written the connection with the universe around you. In the presence of the infinitude of cosmic, planetary, and geologic timescales, the human timescale, the cycle of one human life, can feel staggeringly brief and separate from the continuum. Yet from wielding stone to building telescopes, human curiosity can now gaze back some 13.8 billion years across time to when the elements which comprise stone and, fle and flesh first began to form. Do we not then, in some poetic sense, occupy the same space as infinity? Perhaps this is why we have looked to stones for eons, because in similar poetic sense, stones are a pathway to the infinite. If stones hold memory, then meteorites that have been picked up by human hands have a particularly unique and intricate story to tell, one that spans remnant stellar chemistry, the forming and collision of planets out of pre-nebular dust and human curiosity. These rocks from space have been culturally revered for millennia. One of the earliest known artifacts denoting the meeting of humans and meteorites are nine small hand-formed beads found in Egypt that were made by hammering meteoritic iron with a tool made of earth and rock. They are considered one of the earliest examples of metalwork and tell the unlikely but nevertheless true story of a stone from one planet body being used to reform the stone from another all by the force of human creativity. Yet the meteorites themselves were an amalgam of elements forged during the formation of the solar system and hammed by the, hammered by the force of much larger rocks through the, cataclysmic, through the cataclysm of planetary breakup and bombardment. Although it vast, 
vastly different magnitudes, how elegant the symmetry that both, that the same elements of rock, heat, and force were required to create both a meteorite that fell from its original planetoid to Earth and a bead made from that meteorite to adorn a living being. Rock and flesh continue their entwined journey. Might the human who created these beads have somehow sensed the remarkable story that lay in the mineral structure? Certainly they may have known these stones fell from the sky as there are rec records of meteorite falls dating back millennia, including a crater to the south of Egypt now thought to have formed around the same period. The Egyptian word associated with iron translates literally to mean iron from the sky. Meteorites have touched imaginations and emotions across human history. They, are, they were worshiped and sometimes feared by so many cultures across the ages that volumes have been written about their veneration and significance. Various cultures believed they were sent by the gods. Some thought they were the gods themselves. Other thoughts they thought they were endowed with souls. They held many and sometimes contradictory meanings as talisman, bad omen, and possessor of powers that could both start and end wars. Meteorites are intensely studied by scientists all over the world, the science of meteoritics having come into being in the early 1800s. From these stones, lengthy scrolls of cosmochemistry and physical features, we have learned the age of the earth and the formation timeline of the early solar system. We have discovered grains of material that literally predate our solar system, grains that would be older than 4.6 billion years. We can read the signature of time passing to know how long ago a meteorite fell to earth and how long ago its various minerals and class were formed. We can read the cataclysmic events that it encountered because the physical shock is still visible in the mineral structure. We've classified many varying types of meteorites and have correlated them to asteroids, recounting the story of ancient planet bodies. We have deciphered in the microcosm of meteorites the script of water and the building blo blocks of life and the, and the rocks collaboration in bringing these elements along with others to earth. We have read in the earth's topography the collision with the planet and the part they've played in certain aspects of our own planet's formation and biological evolution. Written in the great volumes of earth's stratigraphy, there is one ancient layer of rock that has particular meaning to us humans a thin layer of claystone about one centimeter thick. This layer in the geologic record has been found at locations around the globe to contain high percentages of meteoritic material, the aftermath of the cataclysmic force of the Chicxulub asteroid hitting the planet 66 million years ago. Estimated to have been up to nine miles wide with an impact equivalence of several million nuclear weapons, to say this rock shook the very foundation of our planet would not be overstating it. Known as the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event, nearly 75% of all species perished. No four-legged land creature over 55 pounds survived, and die-offs among plants, plankton, and marine animals devastated global ecosystems. This stark reminder that we live amidst a dynamic solar system that continues its restless legacy of co collision events should not overshadow the incredible tenacity that life has expressed again and again on this planet. Over the tens of thousands of years of rebounding organisms and adaptations that followed the mass extinction, what is remarkable is that this asteroid impact made room for certain mammal species to radiate, including the one from which we evolved. How poignant and poetic that a stone large enough to decimate one era of species yielded conditions for the emergence of another species one that would come to love stone in a symbolic and ritualized way over millennia, eventually creating the science and technology that would reveal this story. A species that could reflect on its own place within the geologic tones it could now read. Acceptance that shooting stars were in fact meteors which occasionally produced falling stones from space was fraught with contentious disagreement until the early 19th century. In the age of enlightenment, what would become formal disciplines were still wresting themselves away from the conglomerate of ideologies, all seeking an individual stance and separate modes of truth upon which to defend their positions. In 1790, a fireball exploded over the south of France. And although official testimony of the event was given by the town's mayor and 300 eyewitnesses, their confessions were seen by the emerging empirically based science community as a sort of madness. 
To believe, that si to believe that stones fell from the heavens was an affront to the age of reason, akin to the more mystical and religious realms that the new science was quickly separating from. The editor of a notable science journal published a statement about these testimonies saying, quote, how sad is it not to see a whole municipality attempt to certify the truth of folktales. In a paper published the same year entitled, On Some Stones Allegedly Fallen from Heaven, which set out to discredit the testimony, the assistant director of the Imperial, Nat Imperial Natural History Collection in Vienna wrote, it was said that the iron fell from heaven. It may have been possible for even the most enlightened minds in Germany to have believed such things in, in 1751 due to the terrible ignorance then prevailing of natural history and practical physics. But in our time, it would be unpardonable to regard such fairy tales as likely. Though stones falling from the sky seemed preposterous to the emerging sciences, in spite of extensive public documentation over thousands of years, it was through the rigor of knowledge seeking and the courage to face the tension of minds on both sides of the argument that the astonishing truth was finally revealed. As if to resolutely appeal to our hope that wonder prevails in the face of mystery revealed, we learned through objective study and empirical methods that the world of phenomena can be a reverie in its own true nature, that stones can and do fall from the sky. I have often mused while stargazing about the photons that have traveled across the vastness of time and space from a distant star, nebula, or galaxy only to end their long journey by landing on the retina of my eye. Has anyone calculated such odds? Although distinctly poetic, it's not far-fetched in the least to say that turning our eyes to the starry night sky, we receive energy from each luminous object we look at. Whether that photon left the binary star system serious the brightest star in our night sky and traveled the 8.6 light years to reach my eye, or whether it left the Andromeda galaxy and traveled the 2.5 million year distance, at the very moment that photon meets my retina, it is immediately absorbed by my body. Of the two types of cells in our eye, the rod cells are phenomen phenomenally more sensitive to low light and can respond to the meeting of a single photon. When a photon hits the retina, the photon's light energy interacts with photosensitive receptor molecules in the eye's cells, prompting a process whereby the photon is essentially converted to atomic motion, generating nerve cells to be sent to the brain. This all happens within a trillionth of a second. We generally need at least several photons to absorb in quick succession in order for the brain to register the sensation. But if you can see the object, then you are already receiving ample photons from it. In the case of the Andromeda galaxy, it is possible in dark skies to see its faint fuzzy glow with the naked eye. Imagine 2.5 million year old light, starlight photons interacting directly with our brains in less than a second upon arrival. And all we have to do to participate in this dazzling intersection of cosmic and human timescales is to look up at the stars. During my nearly five years living under the dark sky of far west Texas, I remember camping one, one December in Big Bend National Park to watch the Gemini meteor shower, counting 279 shooting stars over two nights. It was my longing for this sort of direct interaction with night sky phenomena, living under the urban skies here in Houston, that propelled my Encyclopedia of Trajectories project. The piece, which is still in progress, intends to study the notion of an embodied relationship with the stars and began with an inquiry into how in our human form, we can comprehend the enormity of our cosmic heritage that we are in our very chemistry of and from the stars. I wanted to find a way to acknowledge this lineage every day, not just in my thoughts, but in my body. In June, 2017, I decided I would draw every shooting star for one year as a way to bring an experience of the stars into my physical form. The work has become a daily practice of learning to embody the stars by reenacting the trajectories of meteors across the night sky through the trajectory I can achieve by moving a brush with my hand across a page. Using a traditional ink brush, I'm performing each meteor event that occurred between June 21st, 2017 and June 21st, 2018 as a single stroke drawing on paper using 24 karat gold. 
Gold seemed the ultimate material to draw meteors because this precious metal arrived to Earth by meteor bombardment during the planet's early formation. We've also recently come to understand that the element of gold itself originates from the merging of neutron stars, which produces a kilonova event thought powerful enough to create the heavier elements, including gold. Remarkably, of the 7,000, sorry, the 5,763 shooting stars that I have now collected for this project and continue to draw, I did not see a single one with my own eye. As far back as we can see in the material remains of our species lineage, cultures have looked to the stars to answer some of the most fundamental human questions, whether to locate or understand our place in the universe or to reflect on the meaning of our lives. Last month, I launched my project Sky Scrolls, a web-based archive of our stories of the stars, showcasing story submissions from people around the world. The idea sprung into being in 2014 while researching our relationship with the cosmos. Learning about the ecological, biodiversity, and human health related impacts due to the loss of our natural night sky from artificial light pollution, I became interested in tracing the impact a view of the stars has had on cultural continuity. Our stories are the cultural evidence of what we hold as meaningful in our hearts and minds, and sharing them allows for a kind of social remembering. Story roots us in the personal, in a personal, social, and cultural experiences, and has the ability to move beyond time and space. Studies in neuroscience have shown what traditional knowledge and culture-making practices have known since their onset, that story can guide us towards empathy, social justice, and personal transformation. While telling our stories to others, the part of the brain that regulates moral sensibility and empathy are illuminated in both speaker and listener. In marking our current personal and global moment through our stories under the night sky, stars and story can be reflections of each other. Stargazing is something we can do from our backyards, our front stoop, rooftop, or windows. Especially in this time of solitude, isolation, and lockdowns, stargazing can connect us even when we are apart. Looking up at the stars together, our eyes themselves become their own constellation. In January 2013, I approached NASA with a proposal to make a 3D virtual library of their astro materials collections. My idea began with a simple inquiry. Might it be possible to hold a rock in one's hand that tells the story of the whole cosmos? Building on my work linking natural phenomena and human meaning, my proposal was to make their Apollo lunar sample collection and Antarctic meteorite collection more accessible to researchers, educators, and the general public. I was interested in delving into and shared, sharing widely and interactively the stories, both cultural and scientific, woven within these rocks from space. Would we know these stories more intimately if we could somehow hold these stones in our hands virtually? Could a direct encounter with these stones and stories provide a, path, a pathway to experience the depth of our connection with the cosmos? The project represents a phenomenal meeting between the fields of art, science, and technology. Over the last eight years, I've had the great honor to lead a truly singular team at NASA's Johnson Space Center Astro Materials Research and Exploration Science Division to develop the technical capacity to achieve this goal. And in December of last year, we launched the project to the public. After receiving a NASA Rose's PDART grant in 2016 to produce this project, I spent three years manually photographing hundreds of angles of 60 rocks inside their nitrogen cabinets at NASA's clean room facilities. My experience spending time with these, these fragments of our solar system has been deeply meaningful to me fueling me to persist through the many challenges my team and I encountered as we carved a novel path to create the final work. Our process combines high resolution precision photography, structure for motion photogrammetry, and X-ray computed tomography to produce research grade interactive 3D models of both the exterior and the interior of each lunar and meteorite sample as a single virtual object within the same coordinate system. We designed the website and custom explorer application 
software to be an active storytelling experience where the viewer goes deeper and deeper into the origin of the stories of the rocks. Astro Materials 3D is as much a rigorous research-oriented library as it is a public artwork meant to deepen our sense of wonder and knowledge of our solar system through a virtual holding of these rare and remarkable rocks in our hands. At its core, Astro Materials 3D intends to provide greater access to NASA's space rock collect collections, making their encyclopedic stories accessible to curious minds across all disciplines and ages. In December, we launched the first 20 lunar and meteorite samples, and the global response to the project has been overwhelming. We will add another 40 rocks over the next six months, and we are now looking toward the future to sample return missions underway and planned that will bring back rocks from asteroids and other planet bodies. This is just the beginning. One of the responsibilities that I feel artistic knowledge has when in collaboration with scientific knowledge is to nurture and defend the important role that meaning has in the search for understanding the mechanisms of our world. That meaning is as important as truth. Feeling value plays a critical role in our ability to maintain our sense of humanity. And it is becoming ever more discussed that the role of empathetic exchange across disciplines may well define the future of problem solving and our ability to balance the many social and environmental challenges we face as a species. Might seeking encounters with the wonders of our world foster a much needed healing for our times? How far reaching is our capacity to connect ourselves to our world? Could the, practice, could the practice of engaging in states of wonder every day help us remember and maintain our eons long love and connection to the world that evolved us? Can wonder lead to an empathetic response to our cur current environmental and social predicaments, reminding us that we are connected to the entire cosmos? The story of connection is all around us, in the stars and the night sky, in the rocks under our feet, and in the blood surging through our hearts and minds. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Erica. That was wonderful. Um, I don't know about the rest of everyone, but I'm just a little bit sort of mesmerized right now. <laughs> Having a hard time formulating words. Um, okay, so I think I'm going to look at the chat and if we have if any of you have any questions that you'd like to add to the chat. Um, there's some remarks coming through that was amazing tremendous. Thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you if you want to take a moment and add a question to the chat, or if you would like to just, um, you know, voice your question, that's absolutely fine. You all have control over your microphones. I do as well, just FYI. <laughs> <laughs> I can mute you at any time. No, I'm joking. Um, so if anyone has a question they want to um, shout out or a comment. Oh, here's a question. Um, this comes from uh, one of our colleagues, uh, art history professor Leslie Shipley. She wants to know how long does it take to digitize one rock? Uh, that's a great question. Um, if I if I were to take away all of the the development that had to occur, because I mean it really took years and years and years and years to develop the process. Um, but if I, if I take all of that into consideration and I'm just, if I was to go into the lab and, and image a rock today, um, it, it takes me about, depending on certain factors, depending on the shape of the rock, the size of the rock, um, the reflectance, the color of the rock, like all of these the characteristics, um, it usually takes me about eight hours to 16 hours to photograph the rock itself. So I'm imaging it from um, about 240 to 480 different angles. Um, so on both hemispheres, um, you know, about 15 degrees around the entire 
surface, both height and rotation. Um, and then, so once I have the photographs, then, um, then we run it through a photogrammetric software. And depending again on um, the number of images and most, most of the time I was using a high resolution Hasselblad camera um, between 60 and 100 megapixels. So, um, it, you know, to run just the algorithm to reconstruct those photographs as a 3D model um, could take anywhere between three hours to three days um, just for the computer to crunch on the numbers and produce the, the texture. And then additionally to that, we scan the rock um, in X, um, X-ray computed tomography. So again, depending on the density of the rock and the size of the rock, um, that can take anywhere from a few hours to um, you know, maybe six hours or sometimes we would run them overnight. Um, and, and so then once I have all of that, then we take those and we use the volumetric model of the CT scans because that's one-to-one, -one, right? So we have like a one-to-one -one volumetric model. And then we take the texture from the photographs and we essentially kind of fuse them. We like to call it the fused model. We, we put them into the same coordinate space. Um, and that's what you see. So, um, you know, so you're talking about maybe a week for, you know, better part of a week for one, for one rock. I, I, there's a couple of wows in, in the comment. <laughs> um, I, I, I quite, there's a couple of questions related to, to that, that project. Um, um, this comes from a, an artist, um, a friend of the museum, Philip. This is a small question. I believe you said the moon rocks are stored in a nitrogen gas filled chamber. And why is that helpful? That's also a really great question. Um, so essentially to prevent it from deterioration from the moisture in our air. So oxygen and, um, and water can, um, can change, can alter basically um, the, the chemistry inside of the rocks. And we see that happen here on earth um, through alteration processes and, and certainly in planetary processes. But it can happen, um, we don't want that to happen because we, we don't wanna impact um, the possibility of, of uh, we don't want terrestrial um, effects on the, the samples from the moon so that researchers in the future can, can study them um, and have them be pristine. So they're kept, um, they're kept in nitrogen. They've been kept in nitrogen environments since they came back from the moon. Okay, thank you. Um, this one goes in a slightly different direction. Um, one of our docents uh, and, and the local artist Lois, she's admitting that her internet uh, stopped working at about the time that you were talking about North America colliding with Scotland. <laughs> no coincidence there, but she just wondered if you could, um, could you just elaborate just a little bit more on that because she missed it and it's fascinating and she'd like to know a little bit more. Yeah, so, um, so this, I was, at the time I was, I was talking about this road cut in, um, on the side of the road, like on the side of the road near Great Loch Ness um, that I passed through that apparently is a, a really significant um, geologic um, research site. And I didn't know that when I was driving through it, but I learned about this in a, um, a really great like geology show. <laughs> The, the nerdy documentary. Nerdy, but yeah, it's so good. <laughs> um, anyway, so what I learned was that that this particular road cut showed evidence of the the time when um, North America, in fact, it's actually the, the Catskills, was connected to Scotland right at that place. And so there are um, remnants of those exact rocks that we now that we see in the Catskills. Um, right there in Scotland. So there, 
at the time when they 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 met, um, when it broke apart, they they left bits of it, of each other <laughs> um, in the rock layer, and you can see that. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, we have a we have a hand raised, so um, I'm going to call. Um, oh. Olivia. Hey, Erica, it's Ali Amali. How are you? I'm good. We're good to see you. Thank you for coming. Um, I know I have my camera off because I'm post um, vaccine number two on the couch in my pajamas. But thank you so much. That was really amazing. Thank you. I have a question that kind of follows up on another comment that um, Sarah made in the chat section who I don't know, but she was talking about STEM students and um, trying to create a sense of awe and wonder in them. And I actually was thinking about that sort of in a broader sense, like as an artist, when you go into work with these scientists and you come with this, um, with your own sense of artistic awe and wonder at what you're working with, like what is the response often? Or is there one? Like, is there, I mean, are they sort of like, okay, like, sure. I mean, what is, do you know, does that make any sense at all? Yes. Yes. Like no, what I'm asking. Yes. Because exactly. to me, I'm fascinated by that. And so I'm just so curious about your experience with that. Well, I, I, I love that question. Um, and thank you for, thank you for asking it. And I also love it because we have scientists here in, in the group tonight. So um, perhaps we can drag some of them in to talk about their experiences also. But, but what I would say, I mean, I, I mean, this is where I think art and science meets is in is in wonder right because we're 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 both i mean that's that, that's where we, we both come at it for, you know looking at the natural world and 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 um or looking at the world like wanting to you know ask questions and make sense of our experience and you know i think it's that probing sense of wonder and curiosity that is exactly where art and science meet and you know i will say that in my collaborations with scientists um, I think that it's wonderful to ask questions that not neither of us expect, right? So, um, and I think that's where the collaboration can really be rich and and deep. And certainly, um, when I first approached NASA, for example, and I was you know all excited about you know this idea of like virtually putting these rocks in people's hands and and sharing these incredible cosmic stories. And, and, and I was like, you know, and because this is part of our cultural legacy. And they were like, what do you mean? <laughs> and I was like, well, don't you, think, don't you think of rocks as cultural heritage? And they were like, no, they're rocks. <laughs> and, and it was so wonderful because of course, they totally understand the cultural importance of these rocks and and you know people from all over the world are coming to see you know the moon rocks at the space center and it, so it wasn't that they weren't thinking about it. It, was, it wasn't that they didn't think that they were significant it was just that they hadn't thought of it in terms of the research and the work that they do and you know when when they were when they're working on um the science it's they're not thinking about the cultural connections necessarily and so which is fair i mean and so, you know, it takes these kinds of interesting conversations. Um, and so when I explain to them, well, I'm looking at these, these intersections that, that, that there's, you know, we can't talk about the, the fact that we're made of stars and then not think about, um, I mean, that was something that was, that's been proven in my lifetime. I mean, prior to that, we, it had been theorized that, that we, we shared chemistry with, with the cosmos. But um, but it was really in in my lifetime and through the study of of um, of these these meteorites and and of course also astrophysics. But but um, it was through these study the study of these that we discovered that in fact we do share this this chemistry with with the cosmos. And so I think about that. I mean, to me, that's like that's a cultural story. You know, um, it has significance in terms of how we think about ourselves and the meaning of our experience. Um, and of course, there are a lot of cultural stories that that talk about where where we're from. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I guess it does. Yeah, no, for sure. I think that what you've shown today and just through your work over the years in general is just how vital both sides of the story are, like the, the numbers crunching and, and the STEM and, and the art, right, that translates it into 
a place of humanity that we can all share and understand maybe. I don't know, I'm just like throwing words out, but. No, I think you're exactly right. Anyway, thank you. That was that was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Ali, for for sharing that. <laughs> yeah, and and I'll just I'll just let you know since um, since you mentioned that the next uh, comment I was going to pull up was was from um, Sarah, a professor here who is a STEM professor, and and her comments were about the the fact that students come into science expecting answers and facts, not questions and uncertainty. Um, and so she's saying that your talk has done such an incredible job of and articulating the value of awe and wonder in science and in art. Um, yeah, um, I, I wanted to ask you a follow up question uh, to, to your daily practice of or, or, or positing that if we had a daily practice of wonder, um, how that might um, inform us and, uh, and inform our um, the way we move through the, the world. Um, Beyond the um, trajectories project, um, do you have other daily practices that in which you engage in wonder um, that you would be willing to share with us? Or, or do you think that everybody has to have their own kind of personal um, practice? Well, that's a great question. Um, I, I guess I would say there's maybe Maybe it's a bit of both. I mean, I think that it's important to make it personal, right? We have to, we all are, we all respond to the world in a different way. So we, we're all going to be more, um, you know, taken by, by certain phenomena versus others. I think that, um, I think there's also places where we can share that wonder. I mean, for me, like, I, I mean, I, I think about the fact that I share matter with stars, you know, all the time. Like, I, I mean, I pretty much think about it every day, which to me is like that daily practice. I mean, I don't know why we're not all dancing on the tables about how incredibly exciting it is that this is, this is true, right? I mean, it's just, we could be excited about this like all day long, <laughs> you know, that we get to be alive, that we have this incredible planet, that it's, you know, was created in a way that we actually can understand now and that we're understanding things you know, and, and, you know, even if the more we understand, the less we understand, I mean, it's, it's, that's exciting, you know, and um, I think we can find awe and wonder in, in, in our homes, around our homes, in, in other people, I mean, just our biological selves, that's pretty wondrous. I mean, I don't, I, I just, I think that there's, there's ways that we can breathe that in every day and, and enact it and practice it and share it. And um, I think the more that we do them, the easier it comes. I mean, I have to say, as adults, we kind of forget how to do that. And, you know, children are really great at it. And we think that we're grown up when we've evolved out of that sort of child, childlike wonder. And I, I, I really want to encourage adults to, to, not let go of that part of themselves because I think that we we really could act reactivate that sense of awe in every day. Um, it might it might change our world. I almost feel like that's such a perfect place to end. <laughs> that statement just feels like like a like the the mic drop is that even still said I have no idea um, <laughs> um I was actually um I I was uh, I was I was thinking about it within the museum or within the art museum you know so and and I think this is true in other museums but I know of art museums you know people adults come in thinking that they need to know something um, and especially, it, it doesn't even matter if it's contemporary art or, or not. There's this, there's this kind of, um, yeah, feeling that you need to know something in order to kind of get it. Um, and, and instead of just being okay with not knowing and just kind of talking about it and discussing it and questioning it and, and, and wondering. In fact, that's actually a technique that we use that, that a lot of art museums use is, is what do you wonder about this work of art. And those questions can help lead to, um, you know, facilitating a conversation. So um, 
yeah, it would be nice if we all could just return to our our blissful chat, or maybe not blissful, but at least our childhood of wonder. Yeah. At least just the childlike mind, you know. I mean, I think that that not being afraid to let that part, that joy, that joy that we that we can experience. Um, and I think also it has to do with um, like how we talk about these things. You know, I think that um, one of the things that I really tried to do with the NASA project. So I, um, you know, I was writing the origin stories of for the rocks, and I felt it was really important to include both the sense of the scientific and also the sense of the wonder as I was writing, because I, I tend to think that when we when we talk about um, science to non-science people, things can get diluted to such a great extent that that the real the core of the wonder um, sort of there's, it's you don't have as much to hold on to. And um, and so I was I you know I, I think that I want people to understand the terms or start to learn the terms or if they don't know the terms to ask what it is or get curious about it, but then also to understand that they don't have to be afraid of it. And the thing itself can be the wonder itself, right? I mean, not knowing something is kind of a wonder in and of itself, right? Um, and so, so I would say that um, one of my favorite comments, you know, we, we got a lot of um, incredible feedback and comments from and um, you know on social media and the, the news when we when we finally published the project and I have to say that one of my favorite ones was this woman who I don't know um, on Twitter who who posted posted um, the link to the NASA site and said rocks from space who has time from for that and then she says my nine-year-old hold my milkshake. <laughs> and I just, I thought it was such a lovely, um, a lovely moment to think back and, you know, to think about a nine-year-old boy thinking that, um, you know, the space rocks were way more interesting than his milkshake. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, uh, Leslie uh, Shipley, Professor Shipley has her hand up. So I'm gonna let her ask her question. Hi, um, I, I can't turn my camera on cause I'm in a, a dark room on my couch as well. <laughs> but I, my husband and I are here and we really enjoyed your talk, um, Erica. I just, I wanted to ask you, I teach modern and contemporary art history um, and photography and I teach landscape um, art both painting and photography. And I was interested that you didn't mention the word sublime. And I was kind of, I thought that was great. I, I like I like the idea of wonder kind of replacing the sublime because I think of like the enlightenment and sublime and awe and there's a lot of problems I feel like with that word. And I don't know if it's a word that you think about at all or. It, yeah, I, it's, it is a word that I think about, but it's not the one that I, I guess I've chosen. And I, I think the reason I've chosen the word wonder is because it's, um, because it is so correlated with our um, emotional capacity for ethical behavior, which I think is really interesting, like that, that we become more compassionate when we're having encounters with, what, with, with awe. And wonder, um, and I, I, so I think I've, I've just, I mean, you're exactly right. There's, there's a lot of complications with, with the word sublime. Although on its own, it's, it's sort of a lovely word too. Um, but I, I, for me, it's really about the, the action of, of wonder, and also the fact that it's, um, it's kind of a neutral word in, in, in the fact that it can, you can, ha you can experience wonder across multiple disciplines or multiple, uh, multiple um, investigations or, or curiosities where, where maybe you can't, um, maybe you can't with sublime. I don't, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I think you're right. I think, I think the sublime feels kind of one-sided and wonder feels like it's more about a relationship for the mm -hmm. across, 
Yeah, no, I, I'm, I, I love that, that idea of wonder. I think that's just fantastic. And I, I'm going to replace, when I talk about the sublime, I'm going to say, well, today we should talk about the wonder instead. <laughs> so thank I you. That's great. <laughs> I'll have to remember that when you bring your students to the museum. Yeah, that's remind me. Remind yeah. me. And Anne, you have your hand up. Oh, wait, you're muted, Anne. All four of the artists in the show, which is intentional, have close working relationships with scientists, um, geologists, botanists, um, Terry in working with the Virgin um, Plains, Prairies of America, and Mark working with geologist and botanist on the desert landscapes. And Jim, of course, with um, all the core samples they've taken from the um, glaciers and studying carbon content in the glaciers way down near the permafrost versus the much higher carbon content on the surface now of the glaciers. I mean, when Martha and I were putting together the show, and Martha is a co-curator of the show, um, we really thought about that component, that, that they were all artists like yourself, but they were all grounded with the kind of logic of science um, as well. So I, I, I was thrilled with your talk you know, in, for many reasons, but I, it's not, it's not discussed in the art world. I guess it's the thing that disappoints me because it so enriches all four artists. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think, I think it's changing. I think they're, they're, I mean, if I look back across, you know, the 20 years of my career thus far, like I can, I mean, I can see the evolution. Like there are, there are fellowships now for artists to do research that, which was never the case. Um, you know, there are museums who are um, actually 100% uh, interested in environment or intersections of art and science. Um, I think there's a lot more curators who are, who are, putting these pieces together and like yourself and 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 really shining a light on what has really been and you know centuries worth of collaborations between artists and scientists if you think about it really um, it's just that it's i think it's coming back into a new conversation um, you know and i also think that one of the things that I, I find really interesting is that um, I really try to put forth this idea that, that, that art is its own field of knowledge. And it's not always seen that way by, frankly, many of the other disciplines, um, that, that art itself is a source of knowledge and that aesthetic knowledge is, is significant in its own right. And I think that as, as that conversation develops more and more, and you know, certainly I feel like my experience collaborating with, with NASA has, has shined a light on that. Like I, I know that my colleagues now understand that, that what I'm bringing as an artist is, is as valuable um, to the conversation about what, what the sciences are communicating. Um, and you know, I think there's, there's a tendency in collaborations between the arts and sciences. And I think I was guilty of this myself and in, in the earlier parts of my career where, you know, it ends up being that, that you know, art is, is illustrating science or is, is doing the PR work for science. And I, I really resist that. Um, I, think it's, I think it's really important that these, these fields of knowledge really maintain their autonomy because they're, as different as they are similar. And those differences are really key. Um, and they, and it's what keeps each of us on our toes, right? Um, and so I think it's really, it's really important that those conversations 
start to happen. And I think the more they do, and the more that artists are involved in cross-disciplinary conversations within all the fields, and frankly, as fields are sort of starting to kind of, the edges of fields are really starting to become a lot more malleable. I think we'll see a lot more of that. Um, This is, I'm, I think I'm going to have to ask for the last call for questions um, or comments in, um, in the chat box. I want to be mindful of time because um, we did go over, but I thought we might. Well, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Erica, for, for allowing us to showcase your work. Um, here at, at the Mayor Museum of Art, um, the exhibition, your, um, in case you, you missed um, Erica's trajectory, Encyclopedia of Trajectories um, is, um, there's tw 20 uh, prints from that series that are um, displayed in the 109th annual that um, Ann Tucker curated. And that exhibition is up through April 1st. Uh, you can also visit online. I put the website in our chat in case you're not local. Um, but thank you for sharing your work with us. And also just thank you so much for this um, really uh, thoughtful and um, inspiring talk. So thank you very much. For the great conversation. Really yeah, thank you. This is a great way to kick off SciFest, I think. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. And thank you all the students for attending today and everyone else, thanks for being here. And we hope to see you at the mayor um, in person, hopefully not in not too long uh, time period and um, also maybe on this virtual space. Thank you, Erica. Thank you. Anne. Thank you, Martha and Laura and everybody who helped to put it all together. Thank you, thank so you all so much. Thank you, everyone. Go look at a star. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>